What's that? Can I tell you? Sure. It doesn't hurt. Sure. It doesn't hurt. Which child? Do you mind? Which child? Oh, Neil. Okay, yeah. Did she tell me it was his real name? I think it is. <laughs> I saw his hanging at home, though, so I don't know. It is. Are you sure it's his? Okay. <clears throat> All right. Supposedly we're live. Oh, on, on the TV. Yeah. Oh. Okay. Isn't that great? We have TV on the TV station. You're right. <laughs> Always wanted to be a televangelist. Now I get to be. Okay, Sarah says yes, we're live. Okay. We have the <clears throat> good Dr. Billadu with us tonight, who happens to get off work on time tonight. <clears throat> All right, Judy's giving me Gatorade for my voice because she's sick of listening to it. She says it'll help. She promises. And so if it doesn't work or if I die during the evening, it's Judy's fault. Well, Bishop was really, really sick one Sunday morning when you were out of town, and I gave him one, and he told me it saved his life. So. <laughs> there you he go. told me he could not have made it through the service without it. Bishop lied a lot. <laughs> he was compulsive. Okay, so we are, let's begin with prayer. Lord God, we give you thanks for gathering us together tonight. We ask you to open our eyes and our hearts to your word. This we ask in your name. Amen. All right, so uh, as you see, I have got laryngitis. Uh, I don't know uh, uh, if I'm hoping that you can still hear me okay online. Uh, and then the room here, you should be fine. Um, we are in the book of Haggai, okay, the prophet Haggai, which is the book of the Twelve, uh, part of the book of the Twelve. Uh, we're in the last, uh, last three, Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi are the last three. And uh, so Haggai, uh, we talked about the introductions a little bit last week. Is Dave coming or not? No? No Dave today? Mm. Um, we did the introduction last week, and uh, we talked about the fact that Haggai is, uh, he's encouraging the people to get moving on rebuilding the temple. That's his main thing. He and, Zach and Zechariah uh, prophesy at the same time. Okay, so... Haggai, it's in the, he prophesies for a couple months, and Zechariah kind of comes in the middle of his prophecy and starts his. Uh, so they're, they're contemporaries. Uh, I think that's all we need to talk about with the introduction on Haggai. Yeah, well, there we are. Um, verse, uh, verse 1. In the second year of Darius the king, in the sixth month, on the first day of the month, the word of the Lord came by the hand of Haggai, the prophet, to Zerubbabel, the son of Shiltiel, governor of Judah, and to Joshua, son of Jehozadak, the high priest. So the first thing you notice here is that he's very specific about when he's writing. Uh, the span is about four months, and it begins in somewhere like August, September, 520 B.C. Very specific. Haggai's one of the few that tells us exactly when he's writing. Uh, they're back from they're back from exile, uh, and they uh, they've been back from exile for a little while now. Okay, uh, he goes on in verse two. Thus says the Lord uh, of hosts. Uh, Lord of hosts is a very uh, common phrase in Haggai and Zechariah. <clears throat> it's um, it's a uh, phrase that's not used very much before the minor prophets. Uh, but it's used a lot by the minor prophets. And, of course, we pick it up. Where do you hear uh, Lord of Hosts in the liturgy every Sunday? In the Sanctus? Yeah, the Sanctus, every Sunday. Uh, you hear the Lord of Hosts. Yahweh Sabaoth is the Lord of Sabbath. People will say the Lord of Sabbath. It's not Sabbath. <laughs> Sabaoth. <laughs> Sabaoth and Sabbath are two different words. <laughs> The Sabbath is the day of rest. Sabaoth is hosts, you know, armies, the Lord of hosts. Um, thus says the Lord of hosts, these people say the time has not yet come to rebuild the house of the Lord. Then the word of the Lord came by the hand of Haggai, the prophet. It is a time for you yourselves to dwell in your, is it a time for you yourselves to dwell in your paneled houses? All this house lies in ruins. Now, therefore, thus says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. You have sown much and harvested little. 
You eat, but you never have enough. You drink, but you never have your fill. You clothe yourselves, but no one is warm. And he who earns wages does so to put them into a bag with holes. Uh, so the uh, first thing that we want to look at there is the curse of, uh, what is it called? I've lost it. Um, a futility, the curse of futility. Uh, th this is a common curse that shows up in the uh, Minor Prophets, isn't it? The curse of futility. Uh, it's a curse that we see in our world all the time. People who keep on and on and on, gaining and gaining and gaining, and never have any satisfaction. Mm -hmm. Why are they not satisfied? If you're a ball player, and you're... I love Edgar Martinez, who was the, was the uh, second baseman for the Mariners for... 20 years and uh, he never made more than 500,000 a year and uh, Ed, 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 Ken Griffey Jr. was coming in and getting in those days a couple million and all these uh, 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 Randy uh, Randy uh, oh, the tall guy 6'10 he went and played for the Yankees anyway he got millions and millions of dollars Edgar he has ever, always got about you know four hundred to 500,000 dollars and they asked Edgar they said doesn't that bother you he says, why? He said, well, these other guys are making so much more. He says, I don't need more money. He says, I have all the money I ever could need. Mm -hmm. Everything I need, why, do I, why would I need more money? Mm -hmm. It's a man in touch with himself. Yeah. And happy. Yeah, the kid that came up through Puerto Rico, came off the streets, dirt poor. Yeah, I was going to say, he didn't, he didn't have anything, have anything. So this was, you know. He had a beautiful home in Issaquah. Yeah. I mean. Fine with it. Yeah. And he's mm -hmm. sit, sitting in a half million dollar home mm -hmm. which was very small by Ken Griffey Jr. standards you know or or uh, you know Microsoft or those guys Jeff Allen or those guys but <clears throat> he was very happy so when people find themselves uh, spinning their wheels to make more and more and more or to achieve more and more and more and are never satisfied I gotta wonder if it's if it's God at work there, the curse of futility. Mm -hmm. That if you if you don't put God first in your life, that doesn't mean you won't be rich. In fact, it, it might mean you'll be super rich because if you follow Satan, he'll pave the way for you. Yeah, he promises to do that, but you're never going to be happy. You're never going to be fulfilled. You're going to go through people and things like you know cheap underwear. It's just, it's just terrible. Uh, thus says the Lord, verse 7, of hosts, consider your ways. Go up to the hills and bring wood and build the house that I may take pleasure in it, that I may be glorified, says the Lord. Is that, I don't know if that's a text right now. <clears throat> um, you looked for much, and behold, it came to little. And when you brought it home, I blew it away. Huff and puff. And yeah, blow the house down. I <laughs> declare the Lord of hosts, because of my house that lies in ruins, while each of you busies himself with his own home. Therefore, the heavens above you have withheld the dew, and the earth has withheld its produce. And I have called for a drought on the land and the hills, on the grain, the new wine, the oil, on the on what the ground brings forth on man and beast and on all their labors. Uh, what's God say there? God is taking away from us. What's he say to, the, to us? And we should be putting him first. Yeah. And if we don't? Plague. <laughs> no. Drought. No food. Famine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and it, it applies to churches and it applies to people. Okay, because this is what I what I warn every church I've served over and over again. When you start being focused on, oh well, we can't do that. We have to pay the light bill. Oh, we can't do that. We have to pay. Yeah, we got. Do you do you see how much snow removal is? <clears throat> when you start stopping ministry. When you start stopping giving to ministry, 
in order to take care of your own little kingdom. Be careful. I, point, I, I have pointed more than one board of stewardship to the Meyer Prophets. So read the Meyer Prophets. What happens when we focus on taking care of ourselves instead of taking care of others? You know, God says, I will not bless that. I will not bless that. You know, if you, uh, with, with your own offerings, if you pay, do everything you want first and then pay out God out of what's left, that's the kind of life you'll get. What's left. You know, if, as a church, if you pay all your bills first and give to God out of what's left, that's the kind of, that's the kind of blessings you'll receive from God. Uh, so, you know, <clears throat> yeah, I know it's hard. And I've, many, many times, uh, I've had people say to me, uh, you know, kind of snidely, when I say, you know, our primary gift as a church is to the district. You know, because the money all funnels up. Mm -hmm. So churches give the district, people give to the churches, churches give to the district, districts give to the, the Senate and missions and all those kinds of things. Mm -hmm. And people who, I can't, and it's so many churches will say, I have, I get a list, I get a, a printout from the district treasurer every month. Is it what, church, what churches are giving in, in, my, in my region? Well, I mean, it's for the whole thing, but I focus on my region. Yeah. And I look at those churches, there's so many of them that give nothing, mm. not a dime to the district. Mm -hmm. And I tell them, I say, give something. I, I say the same thing I get to them that I say to my people. Give something. Because I guarantee you, whatever you give will be blessed. And you'll be able to give more. But give something. You know, but their attitude is, and I was told this flat out by one by one church, well, we're we're doing our own thing. <laughs> we're you know, we're we're we have this going on, this going on, that going on. What are you giving outside of yourself? Well but look what all of the stuff we've got going on. We've got a preschool, we've got a mom's group, we've got um, you know, whatever it was, I don't know. Yeah, but what are you giving outside of yourself? Well, we're doing ministry here. Mm -hmm. You can say the same thing at home. Mm -hmm. I just think about like the look at the Thrive and Choice, I mean Thrive and Action Team thing, and you're supposed to give to the community. That's the whole point of it. And right. I get so discouraged reading the youth leaders' pages because they're trying to figure out how to connive it so that they get all the money mm -hmm. for something they're doing. Mm -hmm. And you guys are examples. You are youth leaders. And here you are. Like, what if I apply for two different events? One for when we actually do the event, and then we'll just apply for one for cleanup. Who thinks like that? Yeah. <laughs> but the whole point of it is <clears throat> go out and do good in the community. And mm -hmm. I just want to see But I, I just think, like, this whole thought process seeps into everything. It's right. Greed. Exactly. It's just greedy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Get something exactly. Something. Yep. And, and, and here we have right in front of us mm -hmm. what happens when you act that way. Mm -hmm. When you make those kinds of choices, God is so clear that you, you won't harvest. You won't, you won't, nothing will go right for you, and you won't be fulfilled. Uh, the people obey the Lord. Uh, verse 12. Uh, then Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, and Joshua, the son of Jehoshadak, the high priest, with all the remnant of the people, obeyed the voice of the Lord their God and the words of Haggai the prophet, as the Lord their God has sent them. And the people feared the Lord. Then Haggai, the messenger of the Lord, spoke to the people <clears throat> with the Lord's message. I am with you, declares the Lord. That's Yahweh there. I am with you, declares Yahweh. And Yahweh stirred up the spirit of Zerubbabel, the son of Shetel, governor of Judah, and the spirit of Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest, and the spirit of the remnant of the people. And they came and worked on the house of the Lord of hosts, their God, on the 24th day of the month, in the sixth month, in the year of Darius the king. Um, that's three and a half weeks, uh, the timing there. 
um, yeah, Sarah says, um, there's a resident who always takes pager call when you only go in if you get called in and he just shows up even when he's not called in just to get more money. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Happens everywhere. And he, you know, let me, let, let me just tell you, I happen to know they get paid $70 an hour. Okay. Ooh. $70 an hour. Ooh. Now I don't begrudge a doctor their money. No. You know, they, they go through a lot of education yeah. and spend a lot of time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But that's kind of kind of uh underhanded, I think. Mm -hmm. You know, he'll just he'll just show up. Whether even though you're you know, you you get you take pager call because Something you know, is you, happening. Well, you're you you're on the pager. So if yeah. you're needed. Yeah. They call you in. I used to do that when I was a, a chaplain. Mm -hmm. We didn't get paid so many dollars, huh? <laughs> but, <clears throat> um, but you know, every, every chaplain had to take the pager. You had to take a turn, mm -hmm. and you took the pager home. And if the pager went off, you had to go in and do it. It used to be forty, and he never took any extra shifts. <laughs> but now that it's more, he has to say in so many shifts. <laughs> yeah, and it's you know it's it, that that's that's the problem. He's also, I happen to know who she's talking about because she's, she's uh, mentioned him <laughs> multiple times. Uh, and he's a very uh, sad and lonely person. Oh. Just, just yeah. nothing, I mean, he's Eeyore, you know, Eeyore in the workplace. Yeah. Nothing's good, the sky's always gray, everything's always bad, yeah. you know. Well, well, yeah. I wonder if you like think that the money is going to make you happy and then it didn't, yeah. well, then you need more money. Because that wasn't enough. It just right. Yeah, it's never enough. Forward and it's never enough. If you're if you are working for the money, it's never enough. If that's why you're working, if that's why you're doing what you're doing, it's never enough. You know, Neil and I are having this discussion now because he's trying to decide. He's uh, officially out of the military. By the way, on oh, March March thirty first, I think it is. Um, but he starts terminal leave February tenth. So he, they, they get terminal leave when they're finished with their assignment. You know, assignment, yeah. And so he ha you know he has officially it's March thirty first, but effectively it's February tenth. Mm -hmm. And so <clears throat> you know he's trying to decide what he wants to do now, mm -hmm. and he has different options and do different things. And one one thing makes a lot of money, and one thing's what he really wants to do. Mm -hmm. And I said, I you know I certainly understand mm -hmm. at twenty nine years old making wanting to make money. You know, uh, and there are people who live in this world, and they do their job to make money, so that they can do whatever it is they do when they aren't doing their job to have fun. And that, if that's how you want to do it, that's fine. I don't, I don't belittle that or anything. I'm my choice was to do what I loved, regardless of the money, and I've never looked back. Uh, I've never been dissatisfied uh, with with my choice. I've been dissatisfied with the money sometimes. <laughs> But you know, but I've never been dissatisfied with my choice. Um, so about three and a half weeks after Haggai prophesied, the people began working on the temple. Pretty good record there, you know, for a pastor to get the people to move in three and a half weeks. <laughs> not bad. To build something. Yeah, yeah, a building plan in three and a half weeks. That's a, I'm pretty impressed. Did everybody agree that? <laughs> yeah. Well, of course Haggai's writing the story. So. That's true. <laughs> uh, chapter two. In the seventh month, on the 21st day of the month, okay, wait a minute, uh, Sarah says, this guy also wants to do cardiothoracic anesthesia, super high pay, and looks down on me for wanting to do peds, she meant peds, she said pets, uh, which is less pay. I don't think you want to do pets. Mm -hmm. I think you want to do peds, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. I'm assuming we're not switching to veterinary medicine at this point. <laughs> That'll take another couple of years. I'm sure that the uh, autocorrect doesn't know what a pet is. Yeah, it doesn't know what pets is. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 I don't know. Maybe she's going to go and say she said stupid autocorrect. <laughs> <laughs> you know, vets make good money. Yeah. Uh, let's see. In the seventh month, the 21st day of the month, the word of the Lord. <clears throat> uh, uh, came by the hand of Haggai to the prophet. Speak now to Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and to Joshua, son of Jehozadak, the high priest, and to all the remnant of the people, and say, Who is left among you who saw this house in its former glory? How do you see it now? 
Is it not as nothing in your eyes? Yet now be strong, O Zerubbabel. Hold on a second. Yeah, right. Uh, this is, uh, by the way, this is sermon number two. For sermon number one was, uh, there's, there's a series of sermons here, uh, four of them in Haggai. Sermon number one was, the house is in ruins, you're living in impaneled houses in your home. You know, apparently your houses are all fixed up nice, but God's house is still in ruins. Sermon number two is now uh, uh, this message to Zerubbabel. Who is left among you so bad? It is, is it nothing, uh, is it not as nothing in your eyes? Verse four, yet now be strong, O Zerubbabel, declared the Lord. Be strong, O Joshua, son of Jehozadak, the high priest. Be strong, all you people in the land, declares the Lord. Work, for I am with you, declares the Lord of hosts, according to the covenant that I made with you when you came out of Egypt. My spirit remains in your midst. Fear not, for thus says the Lord of hosts. Yet once more, in a little while, I will shake the heavens and earth and the sea and the dry land. I will shake all nations so that the treasures of all nations shall come in. And I will fill this house with glory, says the Lord of hosts. The silver is mine, the gold is mine, declares the Lord of hosts. The latter glory of this house shall be greater than the former, says the Lord of hosts. And in this place, I will give peace, declares the Lord of hosts. So a message of consolation and encouragement reminding the people that the God of Moses is still their God. Uh, verse 7, desire of the nations, uh, I will shake the nations so that, uh, let's see, where am I looking? Verse 7, uh, and I shall shake the nations so that the treasures of all nations shall come in and I will fill this house with glory, says the Lord of hosts. Uh, you know the the uh, hymn, uh, O Come, O Come, Emmanuel, mm -hmm. O Come, O Come, a desire of nations come. That's taken from this uh, verse, but it's a mistranslation. And so the ESV has picked up correctly on it. Uh, do we have, does anyone have, uh, uh, let, me, let me go grab my, uh, my uh, King James. Mm -hmm. That's where it comes from. What does uh, the uh, study Bible say? The Lord promises his glory will fill this rebuilt temple as it filled Solomon's temple. Mm -hmm. so that's a book of some way. Why do you say that? Yeah, why King James is a beautiful language. It doesn't always get the, it doesn't always get the correct um, translation. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Uh, so, yeah, and I will, no, King James says, and I will shake all nations and the desire of all nations shall come. They liked that because who does that remind you of? Yeah, that's a, a, a foretelling of Jesus, of Jesus the, right? Yeah. The yeah. desire of all, all nations, nations shall come. come. But the, the word there is really treasures. Yeah, it's, treasure. it's not really desires, it's treasures. That's not, not a good translation of the Hebrew there. But it sure, sure <coughs> made for a nice sermon, you know, is there, <laughs> in, in a good hymn. Um, is this the temple that was destroyed in 70 A.D.? Correct. Okay. Now, uh, I like here, too, where, where God talks about um, the silver is mine and the gold is mine. We, we need to be reminded of that all the time, that everything we think we have is not ours. <laughs> you know, we are middle managers. You know, we are managers of God's money. And, and I think that, that when, when, we, when, when we grasp that is, is uh, and I'm speaking to myself here more than anybody, because you know, being raised in, in a very poor home, it was hard for me uh, to, to let go of that idea that I have to be in control of all this money, you know, that this is my money. Uh, I, but I've noticed that as I grew in faith and I grasped that concept no, it's not my money. It's God's money. It's not my ministry. It's God's ministry. It's not my church. It's God's church. Okay. Then I was able to let go and relax. Uh, and as I let go and relax, my futility lessened and my joy and peace increased. Uh, and, and, I, and it is just so important for us as Christians 
to understand that it's not about us. It's all about how God is using us and, and, and the conduit, that we are a conduit. And we try to be a good conduit. We try to be a, a valuable conduit. We don't want to be a plugged up conduit. You know? don't, I, I preached a sermon that, with that title one time, is Don't Be a Plugged Up Sewer Pipe. <laughs> that was a pa- to a bunch of pastors, uh, because the goal is to keep a f- keep flowing. You know. Uh, the other thing that's really nice here is the latter glory of this house shall be greater than the former, says the Lord of Hosts. And in this place, I will give peace, declares the Lord of Hosts. What temple is he talking about? Our temple. Our body. Yeah, mm-hmm. us. Yes. Yeah, we're the we are the temple <coughs> where it, that is greater than any of the former two temples. Now, we're the temple uh, that 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 gives peace. Remember what what does Jesus say when he walks in after the resurrection? He walks through the wall, he looks at the disciples, and he says, "Peace be with you." Right, peace be with you. And it's and I've I've preached on it before. It's not a fond wish. It's a command. Just like he brought light into being by commanding it. Let there be light. Peace be with you. It is with you. If you choose not to recognize it, that's your business. But it is with you. Okay, moving on. Sermon number three. Well, don't you wish all sermons were this short? <laughs> On the twenty fourth, huh? Nothing. Okay. On the twenty fourth day of the ninth month in the second year of Darius, the word of the Lord came by Haggai the prophet. Thus says the Lord of hosts: Ask the priests about the law. If someone carries holy meat in the fold of the garment, and touches with his fold bread or stew or wine or oil or any kind of food, does it become holy? The priests answered and said, No. Then Haggai said. If someone who is unclean by contact with a dead body touches any of these, does it become unclean? The priest answered and said, It does become unclean. Then Haggai answered and said, So it is with this people and with this nation before me, declares the Lord, and so with every work of their hands, and what they offer there is unclean. Now then, <clears throat> consider this. Now then, consider from this day onward, before stone was placed upon stone in the temple of the Lord, how did you fare? When one came to a heap of twenty measures, were there there were but ten? When one came to a wine vat to draw fifty measures, there were but twenty. I struck you and all the products of your toil with blight and with mildew and with hail, yet you did not turn to me, declares the Lord. Consider from this day onward. From the twenty-fourth day of the ninth month, since the day that the foundation of the Lord's temple was laid, consider, is the seed yet in the barn? Indeed, the vine, the fig tree, the pomegranate, and the olive tree have yielded nothing. But from this day on, I will bless you. Uh, Three months after work on the temple had begun, uh, they kind of quit. So they came back, they started work on the temple, then they got some press, some pushback from the uh, Samaritans who didn't want the temple rebuilt in Jerusalem. And, you know, it kind of got hard and, you know, they wanted to work on their own houses. And, you know, and then, and, and nothing has gone right for them since they quit working on the temple. And God's like, haven't you noticed? <laughs> Have you not noticed? And, and you didn't turn to me. You know, why didn't they turn to him? Why? I mean, you know, everything they did was tainted by unfaithfulness, their unfaithfulness to uh, rebuild the temple. <clears throat> when you try to work around God, nothing will give you peace or contentment. Nothing. When you make God the center, everything will give you peace and contentment. Um, this is a lesson, or it should be a lesson, to our modern world, uh, so many of whom try to keep a foot in both worlds. They try to have a foot in the church and a foot in 
whatever else it is. Whatever else they want to do. I mean, you know, my favorite whipping boy, you know, sports, because <laughs> that's what causes us more headaches than anything. But it could be anything. Uh, you know, I, we were Donnie and I were watching uh, HBO last night, I think, and there was a thing of the mob, and uh, and these guys who were, you know, these devout Christians, <laughs> and then going out and killing people. You know, they do hit some people, and they go right back and go to church on Sunday. They go to confession. They did. They yeah. did. Though. I mean, they yeah. were all Roman Catholics, yeah. and that's what they did. And they were yeah. devout. Yeah. yeah, they did exactly what Father, you yeah. know, Bertoli told them to do. Yeah. You know, because their sins are forgiven, past, present, and future one. And Why so, <laughs> yeah, and so, and, and this, and this is exactly the attitude these people have here. Yeah, is yeah, God's going to be with us. You know, well, let's go build our houses. Let's put our, let's put, let's put that pool in. You know. <laughs> so what? What? How does it end? Is it all about the mob? Oh, the the, the whole series is on uh, these guys who were. Uh, interviewing, you know, former mobsters, and so it's their stories. Mm -hmm. So, uh, it's, a, it's 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 a documentary about these guys' lives. Mm -hmm. Why doesn't the priests and the bishops uh, try to correct these poor souls? Well, uh, President Biden's uh, bishop uh, or a priest excommunicated him. Yeah, wonderful. Look, was... look how well that worked. Yeah. Well, that was still the right thing to do. It was the right thing to do. I I can't imagine the kind of grief he suffered yeah. for that. Yeah, I mean, he did. He stood up for the word of God, uh, the priest. Yeah, and that's wonderful. Yeah, and it'll go someplace else. Didn't do a bit of good. No. As yeah. far as President Biden, he's went right on, and yeah. he's still pushing abortion as hard he, as he ever he did. He just became worse. Yeah, yeah. 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 So, so you know, that's the, the problem is, is that uh, in the church, it's much easier to go along. Uh, because <clears throat> as pastors and priests, you, <clears throat> you, um, it's easy to fall into the same sin and to say, well, if I tick off, you know, Mr. Salvatore, uh, then he's not going to write the check that we need for that new edition that we're putting on. Mm -hmm. uh, so I got to be careful. You know, uh, if I, if, if, you know, if I don't tell the people what they want to hear, They'll leave. Let them leave. And the well, money stops. Then the money stops. And then the money who's stops. going to pay the bills? And mm -hmm. It's, it's easy to fall into that. Very easy to fall into that. Uh, because it's a very worldly reality. You know, and it's a, that's just the, the, the truth of the, the nature of the beast. Um, all right, Sermon 4. The word of the Lord came a second time to Haggai on the 24th day of the month. Speak to Jerubbabel, governor of, Judea, of Judah. Say, I'm about to shake the heavens and the earth and overthrow the throne of kingdoms. I'm about to destroy the strength of the kingdoms of the nations and overthrow the chariots and their riders. And the horses and their riders shall go down, every one by the sword of his brother. On that day, declares the Lord of hosts, I will take you, O Zerubbabel, my servant, the son of Shiltiel, declares the Lord, and make you like a signet ring, for I have chosen you, declares the Lord of hosts. So, sermon four uh, to Zerubbabel, the, go the Zerubbabel, the governor, uh, delivered the same day as sermon three. So that's the sermons three and four on the same day, clearly speaks of the coming Messiah that will shake everything up on this day. That's how you know it's apocalyptic. Zerubbabel is God's chosen tool. When God chooses you to be his tool, you are like his signet ring. Excuse me. Okay. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Something that you stamp with? Yeah, that's the, the ring the king wore. They would put on the to seal his his correspondence. Yeah. So when you are when you've been chosen by the Lord, you can have confidence whenever you're speaking for the Lord. You have to be very careful that you're speaking for the Lord. You know, we've had we're, we're having. I was just on the phone with the first vice president talking about a pastor we're having trouble with who um, has his heart in the right place, but um, we're not sure he's speaking for the Lord. We think he's speaking for himself <laughs> and what he wants. And, and, and um, when, when a pastor has a vision for a congregation and just goes forward pell-mell, this is how we're going to do it. It's a lot like pushing the cooked spaghetti through the eye of a needle. Mm. You know, you have to have the people with you. And you have to make sure that you're speaking for the Lord and not for yourself. So you've got to ask yourself, okay, what is the Lord's goal here? What is the Lord trying to accomplish in this place? You've got to read the scriptures to find out. And then you got to ask, what are the ways that we can get there? And yours, yours might not be the only way. Uh, you have to be able to, 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 to back away and to say, someone, someone else might be leading this vision. It doesn't have to be me. But that, that requires taking yourself out of the equation and saying, you know, there are, there are 300 conduits, I mean 300, uh, uh, yeah, conduits leading into this junction. Mine might not be. There's times when, as the pastor, you're head of the church, and there's times when you're just a member of the congregation. And you got to ask yourself what needs to happen here. And if you dig in and say, my way is the only way, because I say so, it's different from saying, this is the right way because the Lord says so. But if my, I'm saying, my way is the way because I say so, <clears throat> you're not his signet ring. But when you say, this is the way because the Lord says so, and you can, you, you know that's true because you can show it in the word of the Lord, unlike some of our Pentecostal brothers who just have visions in the night and come in and tell everybody this is what the Lord said. <laughs> okay, but as Luther said, you know that wasn't just a bad can of chili. <laughs> All right, uh, questions about Haggai. I thought this um, footnote was interesting. It said that um, through Jesus, the promise descended of David and Zerubbabel, we receive forgiveness for our sins of doubt and worry. What verse are you looking at? It's in the study Bible. Yeah, it's the very last one. It was like the, let me see. It was just like the end of 20 to 23, all the, the conclusion they have about it. Yeah. Let's see. Yeah. Yeah, the promise made to David is repeated to Zerubbabel, the sin of David, through whom the promised Savior would come, yeah. Well, just like this, because uh -huh. it's for our sins of doubt and worry. Right. Because you forget those are sins sometimes. Right. Mm -hmm. that's, right. That's true. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> mm -hmm. Yeah, we receive forgiveness for our sins of doubt and worry. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, so because I, and sometimes people get very frustrated if you if you bring that up, that worry is a sin. We did a whole women's Bible study one time on the Sin of worry. Yeah. It was really eye opening. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I used to love to worry. <laughs> Anxiety. No, I don't like it. I, I was a professional worrier. <laughs> well, yeah. Yeah. So, what were you saying about Anxiety that? is just another version of that, too. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. yeah all, you know, so, so many people have anxiety issues. Uh -huh. and, and they don't like hearing that's a product of sin. That's not sin. That's because, you know, my mother beat me while I was being potty trained. <laughs> or whatever, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, no, anxiety is sin. When you have anxiety, you are saying, I don't trust God to handle this. 
That's what you're saying when you're anxious. If you believe, I'm not saying that I'd never been anxious. I'm just saying you got to recognize it as sin. You know, it, it's that sometimes people have the attitude that we're never allowed to call out a sin unless we're pure and holy. So I can't ever say to you, this is a sin if I've ever committed it. Well, then I'd have nothing to say. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I, I, and, and believe me, I've heard a lot of preachers who have nothing to say. Who stand up and fill a lot of time up there with nothing to say. Because they're afraid. Well? They're afraid to call out sin for that reason. Because they're afraid somebody's going to look at them and say, oh, are you saying you're, you're pure? No. It doesn't matter, though. My, it, you, you don't, you don't, you're not basing your life on me. You're basing your life on Jesus Christ. And I'm telling you what Jesus Christ says. Like all the people who used to tell me, just wait till you have children. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I get that. Guess what? It didn't. <laughs> been there. <laughs> yeah. And, 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 I can't believe it. And I can. Oh, yeah. Oh, I can hear it. <clears throat> to people who are in charge of children, yes. they hear it all the time. I told Pastor Greg, you know, Brigida is uh, due in, yeah, I think, is it April or May? I can't remember, sometime this spring she's due. And I said, your authority level will go up like this when you have your first child. And then when you start getting gray hair, it goes up another end. You know? <laughs> my, my nephew wanted me to dye my beard. I said, when I, because my beard went gray when I was in my, you know, 40s. And I said, absolutely not. <laughs> that gray beard's the best thing that ever happened to me. You know, I mean, it's just the way people think. Mm -hmm. But the, this concept of, well, you don't know anything because you have you don't have children. And that was my first my first three or four years of ministry. Mm -hmm. I heard it all the time, and then I had Neil, and all of a sudden I knew things because I have a child. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, and I, I tell people all the time, you know what? God did not change the rules for me. <laughs> I did not get a new set of rules. Oh, yeah, now that you have kids here. No, nope. still the same rules. You know, this is the way it is. And the fact that, the fact that I fail to, to keep the rules doesn't make me a, an uh, inappropriate or unbelievable conduit. I'm just telling you what God says. So I'm not telling you anything that I say. Okay, let's move on to Zechariah. Which is the next next book. And I passed out Luther on Zechariah. Did everybody get that book? No, Mark? You, didn't get you didn't get Zechariah? Oh, did I, maybe I haven't passed that out yet. No, you haven't. I don't think so. Okay. You were going to print it, remember? I did print it. Okay. I just never passed it out. Okay. All right. So, uh, yeah, I highlighted it on my computer, so it prints that way. Yeah, Zechariah is about 14 chapters. So the introduction to the study Bible is, uh, this is what the study Bible says. As Haggai encouraged the returned Jewish exiles to rebuild the temple, Zechariah encouraged them to repent and renew their covenant with God. Such spiritual renewal would be necessary for the people to be ready to worship God once the temple was rebuilt, about 516 B.C. He accused them of doing the very thing their ancestors had done before the exile. He was concerned about social justice for widows, orphans, and foreigners. But <clears throat> as the people endured opposition from the non-Jewish inhabitants of Judea, Zechariah reassured them of God's abiding comfort and care. God would continue uh, his covenant with Israel. Messianic hope was, the re was rekindled in Zechariah's ministry, and the book ends with the promise that the Lord would establish his rule over all the earth. Okay, somebody read Luther on Zechariah. I'll start. <laughs> the prophet lived after the Babylonian captivity. With his colleague, Haggai, Haggai, he helped to rebuild Jerusalem and the temple and to bring the scattered people together again so that government and order might be set up in the land again. He is truly one of the most comforting of the prophets. He presents many lovely and reassuring visions and gives many sweet and kindly words 
in order to encourage and strengthen the trouble and scare the people to proceed with the building and the government despite the great and varied resistance which they had which they had to all uh, which they had till then encountered he does this down to the fifth chapter in the fifth chapter under the vision of a scroll and a bushel he prophesies of the false teachers who are later to come among the Jewish people and who will deny Christ. And this still applies to the Jews at the, at the present day. In the sixth chapter, he prophesies of the gospel of Christ and a spiritual temple to be built in all the world because the Jews denied him and would not have him. In the seventh and eighth chapters, a question arises which the prophet answers encouraging and exhorting them once more to build the temple and organize the government. And with this he concludes the prophecy about the rebuilding in his, in his time. In the ninth chapter he proceeds to the coming times and prophesies first in chapter 10, 9, 1-6 of how Alexander the Great shall, con shall conquer Tyre, Sidon, and the Philistines so that the whole world shall be open to the coming gospel of Christ. And Zechariah 9, chapter 9, verse 9, has a King Christ coming into Jerusalem on an ass. In the 11th chapter, however, he prophesies that Christ, that Christ shall be sold by the Jews for 30 pieces of silver. Chapter 11, verses 12 and 13. For which cause Christ will lead them, so that Jerusalem will be destroyed, and the Jews will be hardened in their error and dispersed. Thus the gospel and the kingdom of Christ will come to the Gentiles after the sufferings of Christ in which he, as a shepherd, shall first be beaten and the apostles, as a sheep, be scattered. For Christ had to suffer first and thus enter into his glory. Luke chapter 24, verse 26. In the last chapter, chapter 14, when he has destroyed Jerusalem, he abolishes also the Levitical <coughs> priesthood along with its organization and utensils and festivals, saying that all spiritual offices, offices shall be held in common for the worship and service of God and shall not belong to the tribes of Levi only. That is, there shall be other priests, other festivals, other sacrifices, other worship which other tribes could observe. Indeed, even the Egyptians and all the Gentiles. Surely that is the outright abolition and removal of the Old Covenant. Okay. This is wonderful. Where did you find it? That's in the uh, study Bible. <coughs> oh, yeah. Like in this Bible. Right, which yeah. I don't get. Yeah. Chapter has some extra ones. Yeah. So, uh, <laughs> interestingly enough, the liberals uh, don't like Zechariah <laughs> uh, 9 and following. They'll tell you that 1 through 8 was written by Zechariah, but 9 and following was just written by other people and inserted later. Because it's such a clear prophecy of Christ. Okay. And if you believe that the Old Testament contains clear prophecies of Christ, then you have to believe everything else the Old Testament says. See, you don't get to cherry pick and say, well, I'll believe this, but not that. You know, uh, So we have to get rid of those kinds of things. So there are such clear prophecies because that's going to interfere with us saying, well, yeah, but that was just all dated and cultural and <clears throat> this and that and the other thing. So it's not unusual. I'm not, we're not going to spend a lot of time with that, but that, that they don't like Zechariah 9 through, 12, 9 through 14. Uh, beginning at verse 1. In the eighth month, in the second year of Darius, the word of the Lord came to the prophet Zechariah, son of Berechiah, son of Edo, Say, okay, well, first of all, we don't know who any of those people are. No, never heard of those things. Uh, we're not sure. We, we're pretty sure Zechariah was a priest, as Haggai was too, probably. Uh, because <clears throat> during the exile, the, the, there, were no, there was no reason for priests, because there was no temple. Mm -hmm. So the priest and prophetic offices kind of coalesced. And so it wasn't unusual to have a priest and a prophet be the same person. <clears throat> So you're very much with Haggai and Zechariah getting some priestly influence. Um, but who, Berechiah and the son of Edo, as we don't know, uh, Zechariah is also uh, mentioned in Nehemiah. So, uh, you know, we know he was, he, he really was a person. We just don't know anything else about him. 
uh, the Lord was very angry with your fathers. Therefore, say to them, thus declares the Lord of hosts, return to me, says the Lord of hosts, and I'll return to you, says the Lord of hosts. Do not be like your fathers, to whom the former prophets cried out. Thus says the Lord of hosts, return from your evil ways, from your evil deeds. But they did not hear or pay attention to me, declares the Lord. Your fathers, where are they? And the prophets, do they live forever? But my words and my statutes, which I commanded my servants and the prophets, did they not overtake your fathers? So they repented and said, as the Lord of hosts uh, purposed to deal with us for our ways and deeds, so he has dealt with us. <clears throat> All of that is to say, learn from your mistakes. Uh, one of the purposes of the prophets, as one of the purposes of preachers is, to remind us of stupid choices that we've made and try to avoid them in the future. Uh, that, that's it's why it's not an easy office. Uh, and we are in a time now, just like the time of Zechariah, of uh, moral relativism. It seems to be a constant plague on God's people. Uh, Luther felt like it was just as real for him as it is for us, as it was for them. We want an easy path. Okay? We want either to flog ourselves uh, for sins that have already been forgiven and just continue beating ourselves up and never let up and flog everyone around us for sins that have already been forgiven, or we want to happily pr prance around in depravity uh, and pretend like everything's okay because Jesus came. So therefore, you know, we don't have to, we can do whatever we want, you know. God's path is the middle road. That's why it's so hard. It's easy to go all in one way or all in the other way. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> it's easy to be a legalist. Mm -hmm. Because you have a book of rules, you just keep them. Mm -hmm. And you, you condemn anybody who doesn't follow your rules that, that, that you say is in the book of rules, wh whether it's Christian or Islam or whatever. Um, the other side, moral relativism is do whatever you want. As long as you're not hurting anybody, what's it, what difference does it make? That's the, those are easy. God's path is right down the middle of saying you forgive yourself, you forgive others, but you continue recognizing that there is right and wrong and you're trying to stay on the right path. And that's hard. <clears throat> There's no way around it. That's hard. Any uh, further thoughts on that first section? Moving on then, verse 7. On the 24th day of the 11th month, which is the month of Shabbat, in the second year of Darius, the word of the Lord came to the prophet Zechariah, the son of Berechiah, son of Edo, saying, <clears throat> Now, we're going to start with a series of eight night visions. So every at night he's getting these visions, okay? I saw in the night, and behold, a man on a red horse, riding a red horse, he was standing among the myrtle trees in the glen, and behind him were red, sorrel, and white horses. Then I said, What are these, my lord? The angel who talked with me said to me, I'll show you what they are. So the man who was standing among the myrtle trees answered, These are they whom the Lord has sent to patrol the earth. And they answered the angel of the Lord who was standing among the myrtle trees and said, We have patrolled the earth. And behold, all the earth remains at rest. Then the angel of the Lord said, O Lord of hosts, how long will you have no mercy on Jerusalem and the cities of Judah against which you have been angry these seventy years? And the Lord answered, Gracious and comforting words to the angel who talked with me. So the angel who talked with me said to me, Cry out. Thus says the Lord of hosts, I am exceedingly jealous for Jerusalem and for Zion. I am exceedingly angry with the nations that are at ease. For while I was angry but a little, they furthered the disaster. Therefore, thus says the Lord, I have returned to Jerusalem with mercy. My house shall be built in it, declares the Lord of hosts, and the measuring line shall be stretched out over Jerusalem. Cry out again, 
Thus says the Lord of hosts, My cities shall again overflow with prosperity, and the Lord will again comfort Zion and again choose Jerusalem. Uh, there's two things in that vision that, that uh, really stand out to me. Uh, one is that the angels are patrolling the earth. I love that vision mm -hmm. of the angels on the horses patrolling the earth, mm -hmm. uh, executing God's plan, mm -hmm. you know, whatever God's plan is. Um, two is that the angel of the Lord, Jesus, I don't know, it's not clear here because he's not worshipped. When he's worshipped, then we know it's Jesus. But uh, could be, <clears throat> is in control of assuring his people that they are still God's prize. And that the nations who, uh, who dealt badly with them will be punished. Because he used the nations against them. But then the nations relished it. Mm -hmm. They enjoyed it. And that wasn't okay. Uh, and God's going to deal harshly with them. So those are the, that, that's the first vision. We're going to stop there because uh, the second vision is even more fun. Uh, but I love that vision of the angels patrolling the earth. All right. Yeah, the four horns and the four craftsmen is next. Uh, what's next week? Two, six? Tomorrow. Seven. Yeah, seven. seven. And then the next week after that, just so you're thinking ahead, is Valentine's Day. Right. And the DQ opens. Yay! Oh, it does? It? <laughs> so what are you saying? You want to go to the DQ? No, no I'm fine. I thought maybe... So nobody goes to the Villa No. My wife and I are going out on Friday night, for Valentine, the Friday before Valentine's Day, because we there's nothing I detest more than being in Valentine's Day crowds. Yeah, right. And the prices go up. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So we're going out on the tenth yeah, for dinner. <laughs> All right. We'll close with the blessing. The Lord bless us and keep us. The Lord make His face shine upon us and be gracious unto us. The Lord that His countenance upon us and give us peace. Amen. Amen. All right. Thank you all for well, staying with for my <laughs> voice tonight. I hope we have one for tomorrow. Yeah.